Hello, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, to this uh, MS Vishweswaraya Okakura Tenshin lecture series. Uh, this uh, lecture series is being organized as part of Japanese Studies India's uh, activities, online events. And uh, Professor Bridge Danka is curating this lecture series. And this is the first lecture in the series. Uh, Professor Bridge Danka will introduce, uh, will talk about the lecture series more later. But before that, I just want to uh, introduce this uh, group called Japanese Studies India uh, to those who uh, do not know about it. Uh, this is something that uh, some of us uh, thought about last year. Uh, uh, even In fact, just before the pan pandemic started in India, uh, we thought that we should have a forum, we should have a, have a, something like an association of uh, Japanese studies scholars in India. And just after that, uh, the pandemic started and we thought that the best way to start right now is to have a mailing list. So we started this off as a mailing list. Uh, it's on Google Groups. And uh, then we also have a, a, a website uh, which has a, a lot of information Apart from how to join the mailing list, we also have a database of Japanese studies scholars, uh, which is growing. It's not complete though, uh, but uh, we have that. And we also have a few resources like a calendar of uh, different fellowships and grants that uh, are available for Indian scholars and uh, also a few other useful resources on the website. So I would recommend that uh, those of you who are interested in this and have not checked it out, please, uh, you can, I'll, I'll share the link uh, in a few minutes. You can uh, check the website out. So uh, this, uh, apart from this uh, lecture series, we are also doing a young scholars lecture series, uh, which we call the JSI workshop series and two, uh, Workshops have already been conducted. Uh, one was uh, an anthropological one, uh, which was about uh, birth, uh, childbirth rituals uh, by Hia Mukherjee. And we also had another by Sharmishtha, which was on anime fandoms in India. And in the future also, we'll have uh, uh, more lectures, more talks uh, by both young scholars. And also uh, we'll have like other lecture series uh, by established experts as well uh, so uh, today today we have uh, richard emmert uh, will uh, deliver the inaugural lecture uh, we have uh, professor anuradha kapoor uh, as the discussant and uh, professor bridge danka as the chair uh, i would now uh, after we have the event i will share a feedback form and i request uh, all of you who are present to please uh, submit the feedback form. It helps us in understanding how we are doing and what else we can do uh, in the future. So uh, I'll uh, request Professor Bridge Tanka to take over from here. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Tariq, and thank you everyone for coming here. Um, first of all, yes, I think it's a great achievement that Tariq has set up this group. Uh, it shows a Japanese studies is moving slowly, but surely in a, you know, more and more people are becoming interested. Because in the 1970s, when I was in JNU as a research scholar, we tried uh, starting a bulletin uh, um, under Professor Murthy, Narsima Murthy, and we got to two issues because in those days, uh, paper was restricted, as some of you will remember. Um, I had to use some family connections to get paper for the second uh, printing. So mercifully, some of these technologies allow for uh, a little, uh, make things easier. And certainly today we have people from around the world joining us. So I'm very grateful to these technologies as well. Um, but I'm very grateful to the Japan Foundation for coming in supporting this initiative. Uh, Mr. Sato is an old India hand. Uh, those of you who don't speak Japanese can speak to him in Hindi. Um, so uh, he was very quick. Uh, he's been running the office on his own during these uh, times because of uh, the pandemic. And he was, uh, you know, immediately saw this was a good thing and supported us. Um, the reason I chose the uh, title or 
Vishweshwaraya and Okakura, because uh, in a way, I thought both of them represent, uh, you know, new ways of seeing, dealing with their changing environment. Uh, Visheshwaraya was a modernist. He doesn't have good press these days. He was a dancer and so forth. But he was one of the earliest to actually look at Japan. He was a young engineer in Bombay, and he decided that what Japan was doing was what India should be doing. And so he went there to actually study what was on his own, no funding, etc. He went there. He later took industrialists with him that they should also see. He focused on the idea of, you know, the government should support infrastructural development and education. At the time, uh, you know, colonial governments weren't interested in this. The feudal rulers who get a bad press also were actually doing some of these things in Baroda, in Jaipur, and uh, Hyderabad, and so on and so forth. Later as Divan, he did a lot of things. He traveled to Australia, to America, to England, and set up universities and so forth. Okakura, in a way, sometimes gets lost in this Asia is one. The second part of his senten uh, that sentence was that the Himalayas served to divide. So he, you know, he didn't see Asia necessarily as an entity. And he also died in 1913. So his ideas were later used by uh, people in very different ways. But what was important about Okakura, I think, is for us to learn, we needn't follow these people blindly, is that he, he, he realized that we knew very little about each other. He said, you know, the scandals of Paris are better known than what happened to Arabi Bay and so on and so forth. So, and by knowing each other, we can develop new modes of consciousness. So I thought that was an important thing. And I think it's for these reasons that I chose this uh, series uh, to honor them, as it were, and to uh, create a place for dialogue, not to study Japan as some exotic or uh, specialized subject, but as something which speaks to our everyday concerns. And uh, it's with this thing that I'm really happy to have uh, two friends and not just because they're friends, but because they're very distinguished in their own capacities and in their own uh, fields. Uh, Richard Emmert, uh, you know, he spent a lifetime in a very obscure, closed world of no, established himself as a performer. He studied under the legendary Koizumi Fumio, who actually introduced Indian classical music to uh, Japan, amongst many other things. And Koizumi studied in the South as well as in the North, Karnataka and Hindustani. And uh, he's also got, Richard has also got me prize. So I think in a way he, and secondly, not only is, is he an established no performer, uh, but he's also used no in the English environment. He's built on a tradition which goes back to Yeats and um, Ezra Pound and Britain and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's a creative use of old things. And I think, and Anuradha Kapoor is a distinguished director who's done a huge number of very powerful, moving plays. She has a great political vision. She focuses on, uh, you know, the ordinary and everyday in life, and uses that in very imaginative ways. So I thought uh, these two people, in a dialogue, in a you know, from coming from some different backgrounds, would have uh, a great resonance and meaning for us. So I'm very grateful to uh, both of you for agreeing, and I'm very grateful to all the people who are attending. And uh, with these words, first, I'd like to just hand it over to Mr. Sato in case he'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Tanka Sensei. And uh, hello, everyone. Maybe I don't have any further words to add on a uh, great, great speech by Tanka Sensei. But, uh, yeah, uh, as he said that, just, you know, uh, just uh, when when just we were uh, hinted by Tanka Sensei and Tarek San just about uh, uh, opening this kind of series uh, uh, with the initiative of JSI, yeah, I suddenly just, you know, realized that how important it is and, uh, yeah, very quickly decided to support. And, uh, uh, as a first ever, just you know, uh, event of the series, uh, it is a great, great thing that just we uh, are welcoming just you know a great scholar and practitioner, uh, Richard Emato-san, in Japan, and also uh, very renowned director of theater, uh, 
and another song and another tea uh, as well as my all my all good friends as well and uh actually so okakura uh, was used to uh maybe coupled with tagore but this time uh, tanka sensei just you know uh named just sir mv <laughs> that is not so much popular maybe either in india or in japan but uh I, I just I recently just read about him and uh, quite amazed by his, you know, uh, I mean, effort, lots of effort or curiosity or great work as a, for the development of my soul or India itself. So maybe with the same spirit, maybe to know the others and uh, learn from them and uh, maybe, uh, maybe utilize that knowledge i mean for the uh for the peace and development so maybe uh, I, I wish that this platform just also will develop as a very good you know meeting point of discussion or sharing of the knowledge in the future and uh let's enjoy today's uh, lecture and the discussion thank you very much so rick uh Okay. Uh, one little thing before I hand it over, we'll uh, uh, put out a notice of the uh, forthcoming lectures from now to uh, uh, December. Um, so just block your dates, we'll uh, send the notices afterwards, the formal notices. Thank you. Rick, please. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I should say that I first met Bridge here in Tokyo, uh, I think it was 1975. And uh, I think maybe, Bridge, you came here in 74, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, under the auspices of the Japan Foundation. Um, actually, in 1976, there was something called the Asian Traditional Performing Arts. And I was asked by uh, Professor Koizumi at Tokyo University of Fine Arts and Music to be involved in that. And that was something that was also sponsored uh, by the Japan Foundation. So that was my first connection to the Japan Foundation. And uh, and so uh, I actually, uh, along with Bridge, uh, have a very long connection uh, with them. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sato-san, for, for helping uh, or having Japan Foundation be involved in this. Um, as Bridge mentioned, I actually, uh, well, I've been in Japan. I first came in 70, 71, and then went back. I'm from the United States, went back, graduated from uh, 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 a liberal arts college there, and then came back in 73. And uh, uh, also around that time was able to, in 74, I guess it was, entered Tokyo University of Fine Arts and Music. But from 73, I started taking lessons in uh, Japanese no theater. And uh, of course, I've met with various people. I mean, I remember one time visiting a friend of mine, and this was after having studied for several years, who said to me, why are you studying no? Um, because it really doesn't have any meaning for Japanese people today. And uh, uh, I was quite offended by it and probably didn't have a very good answer for him, I mean, he was saying, you know, it would make more sense to study uh, politics or or uh, uh, history, which I had actually studied as an undergraduate. And uh, I, I don't think I had a good answer for him. I think I might have said something, well, um, or I think he said economics. And I think I said something, well, I'm not really interested in, in that. So I'm interested in no, so I'm just doing what I wanted to do. And, um, and of course, when I came, I thought I was going to be here for two years. And as you can see, I've essentially been in Japan, except for, I think there was one time I was gone for seven months, months teaching in the United States, shorter periods of time I've taught elsewhere. Um, but I also made a trip actually in, uh, I think it was in the summer of 1988, uh, maybe it was 87, when uh, I taught uh, um, for just two weeks at the National School of Drama, NSD in New Delhi. 
And uh, this was under the director Ratan Tiam, and uh, along with the uh, Kitano actor Akira Matsui. And uh, in a short span of two weeks, we organized performances. And in fact, those performances, believe it or not, were in Hindi. And uh, the Hindi had been translated from Japanese, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, from English, which had been translated from Japanese. And so uh, we, uh, there was Hindi, and then I had to go through line by line. We only used about a short section from each play that we did, and uh, had to go through line by line to uh, make the Hindi fit with the Japanese music. And of course, I didn't really understand it. Uh, it just seemed like there was one thing that got repeated because we didn't have enough words. And I sort of remember it went something like, Haruki, 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 Haruki is, and I don't know, maybe that pronunciation doesn't make sense at all, but that's about the only thing I remember from it. I didn't have to sing it, but I think I played a uh, taiko drum with it and had to uh, teach the students uh, along with uh, Akira Matsui and teach the movement. And then, then we had a short section of the music. Um, so um, in fact, there is a small connection I have with India doing all of that. But today I would like to talk a little bit, um, first of all, maybe about the first, um, now we probably only about 30 minutes or so, maybe less than that, 25 minutes or so to talk a little bit about No and Kyogen in general. And uh, uh, maybe, we should start that off. T Tarek, would you be able to um, show that first um, five minute clip of uh, from YouTube? Could you do that? Sure. And these are clips, I, they're from Atsumori. I found them on YouTube um, and uh, later on, a text that I have that has these clips, but there are a lot of other materials on YouTube. So you get the chance to uh, look at any of this, uh, at anything, this would be very good. Yes. <laughs> These clips are from a uh, from the play Atsumori. Can you hear me? Yeah. Both of these clips are from Atsumori. What you just saw was toward the end of the piece. This is actually a little bit earlier on, um, and you can see that there's some Japanese written in there for those of you who read uh, Japanese kana. Now this is the exact same thing, uh, but using the Japanese characters instead of the katakana. Mm -hmm. so. 
From the play Aoi no Ue. I don't explain it, but. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Tarek, would you now move to the um, that Word document that I sent you, if you can do that? And uh, normally I would try and share it from my screen, but uh, we tried it, and this is my first time to use Google Meet. I use Zoom a lot. But um, what I'd like to show is uh, we'll go through this uh, fairly quickly talking about certain aspects of no, um, and probably we'll have to skip a lot. And uh, later, I hope this will get posted maybe on the website if anyone wishes to download it and can look at it a little more in detail. Um, we talk about no as being around 650 years old because uh, in the Muromachi period or uh, maybe in the middle of the 14th century, uh, particularly is when we think of no as, as uh, really beginning to come into its present form. And of course, there were roots that preceded that. Um, and, and there are certainly several books that will talk about that. But a lot of the no plays today, in fact, were written in a period, what's called the Muromachi period, from this mid um, 14th century to the mid uh, um, 16th century. Um, and I would say most of the plays in the present no repertory are from that period, strangely enough. Today, there are new no plays being rented, written, but not so many. And there I have listed right after that three people that are of particular note. Um, Zayami is perhaps considered the, the uh, father of No, uh, because he wrote a number of plays. Then he also uh, wrote a lot of treatises um, that describe No and things about how it should be performed, how it should be written, um, various things that his own father, and that's the next name, Khan Ami, taught him. So Zayami wrote most of it, but he sort of said it was Khan Ami, but it's really Zayami that we hear of the most. 
And then the next person, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, was a, shog a shogun, that is a military um, leader of the Ash in the Ashikaga period there. And uh, um, he, was, he was the one who became the first um, patron, uh, well, uh, of, of great note, that is. And so from that time, um, he, or I should say, no, became very connected to the military rulers of the country and um, Yoshimitsu. And then those who succeeded him all, re all were, um, uh, had their own favorite no actors. And, uh, and this takes it up uh, over a couple hundred years to the time of the Edo period. And that's what I've listed next from the 1600s to the middle of the 1800s. And it was during that time that no was considered the official performing art of the military class. Uh, and that included the military government, as well as the various daimyo or lords of various regions. And so many lords of, of regions of Japan supported no actors. And, uh, uh, and so it's quite interesting that that's where the uh, official support came from. And if you can uh, sc scroll down just a little bit, Tarek, on that. And there, here are the f different types of plays and I'll just really go through them very quickly. And this is not the way it's always, always has been but it pretty well settled into this uh, format during the Edo period when it was a, became a kind of ritual uh, to have a day of plays. Um, the plays themselves aren't necessarily ritual in themselves, but it became something that um, uh, was often performed. And so there are generally five categories and you can see them listed here. Um, uh, first category play were plays about gods, and they tended to be connected to Shinto, um, that is sh the Shinto animistic religion. Um, and so the gods were gods of particular shrines, Shinto shrines, or sometimes um, uh, gods that were form a part of, of Japanese mythology, for example. Uh, in any case, so much of the first category we think of generally as more, um, uh, not entirely uh, uh, Shinto, uh, but, but probably emphasizing more Shinto aspects. But then thereafter, most of them um, emphasize a little bit more Buddhist aspects, some to a large degree, some not so much. Um, a great deal. In fact, there are Buddhist references even in some of the first category plays. Of course, it points out this wonderful connection, uh, wonderful or interesting connection when you look at pretty much the rest of the world when we don't think of having two religions or people being uh, believers of two different religions. But Shinto and Buddhism was always this kind of situation. Um, so you have second category plays, and these were warrior plays of, of, uh, from the period of uh, generally stories from the Genpei Wars, the Genji and the Heike Wars, the civil wars of the 12th century. And uh, almost all the warrior plays, except for one notable one, but all the others uh, feature individual warriors. From the video that you just saw, I mentioned Atsumori, and this was about a young Heike warrior. Um, well, he's a lieutenant. But as warrior plays go, they don't emphasize the battle aspects of it. Right at the end of the clip you just saw, you saw him take out a sword and fight. But in fact, um, it, it, what they are, they're, they're stories um, of all these warriors who have died. And so they come back as the as ghosts, often and in, in the place where they fought, and whether they were victorious uh, or they were or they lost on the losing side, uh, uh, their spirits come back and often encounter a Buddhist priest, and they appear before a Buddhist priest and ask for prayers. 
And generally in the very end of the play, they tell how they are fighting in warrior hell. Whether you win or lose, you're still fighting the battles. And it's a little PTSD-like in a sense that no matter how the the battle itself turned out, your the horrors of war still go on in after death when you're suffering in warrior hell. Um, but I'm going to move forward then. Then there are third category plays, women plays, and these tend to be the slowest. Um, and when I say women, they tend to be young, very beautiful women who are featured in these plays, but they are also, for the most part, there are exceptions to this, where you have people who are living in the present, but most of the third category plays are, are of young women, uh, stories of young women who had suffered, they might've actually grown very old, but now they appear as a young woman, and particularly in the first half, and then as a local person, who then, then in the second half of the play is actually um, comes back as presumably her true self and the spirit of this woman who might have told of her love of a, of, of a certain, um, of, of a particular person, a particular man who had, had um, they had loved but had suffered through all of that. Um, but um, these are the slowest, but the most poetic. Um, I always found them the most difficult to understand when I was first going to see no plays. You would be there and not understanding everything that's going on. No one moves for 15 or 20 minutes and you're wondering, well, what is going on? You know, um, they're singing and uh, there might not be much movement at certain times, but it still has a kind of dynamic to it, which is still very, very interesting. And now that I'm, I've been around No for going on 50 years, I kind of feel like I'm starting to get um, much more of an appreciation for the, in some ways, the very difficult plays that are these third category plays. The fourth category plays are a miscellaneous grab bag. Uh, there's one um, kind of type of play within that category called um, Miss Mad Women Plays, uh, in which um, one thinks about, okay, third category women, fourth category mad women. Well, that seems a little strange. But the reason they have gone mad is because they've lost a child and they are hunting around the country, going from place to place, uh, searching for that child. And, um, and in most cases, um, they actually are reunited with their child. And so they end in that case uh, quite uh, hap happily. There is one, uh, Sumida River, Sumida Gawa, uh, in which they, they come and they find out that their child had died exactly a year ago to that day. And the local people are having a ceremony for him. And finally his mother comes and participates in that ceremony. So that one is one of the very, very sad ones there after the performance, you sort of see people coming out and sort of uh, brushing away their tears and everything. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty sad one where you don't have a lot of that in the sense of a comedy tragedy kind of situation because many of them are, you have, uh, um, you know, priests praying for, for them, and and so it actually ends in a very good way. But then you have the fifth category plays, and you can see um, their demon tend to be demon plays, and these end up featuring also a priest, oftentimes who uses their power of Buddhist prayers to quell the demon, and uh, so all of that is done in a very, uh, I would say, interesting way. It quells. Uh, them, not that it kills them because the demons then go off and, and they have to actually appear for the next time the play is done. So um, so that's what they do. But um, okay, if you can move that down a little bit, Tarek, we'll move on. And uh, next I have just a typical story and, and you can just very quickly see what it is. So a priest, famous, it's, it's a famous place, meets someone who appears to be a local person 
And in speaking to the person, that person reveals that they are long departed spirit of someone, of course, someone who lived long ago, but who was closely related to the place. In the second half, they appear again in their true form, whatever that is, of long ago. They, they're, they, and they further tell their story. And when there's a priest, it asks the priest to pray for them. Of course, not all plays are this way. There are many exceptions. Those certain miscellaneous plays, if they don't fit into another category, they go into those miscellaneous plays. Some are plays of that are taking place in the present. Um, so I won't dwell on that. Going on, what you have a reference to next are types of roles. And uh, you have um, the shte, the main character of a play. And so in the clip that you just saw, there was really one person dancing. And that is the shte, the main character. Um, sometimes they are accompanied by someone, and so there's a role called a tsure. Um, but also there will always be a secondary role called a uh, waki. And the waki never wears a mask, and, and we'll bring up about masks in a little bit. But the shte always, uh, not always wears a mask, because those plays where it is a man living in the present, they never wear a mask. Um, and instead, there are some some plays, and even though known it's known as a mask drama, there are some plays in which no one is wearing a mask, um, but their faces are, in a sense, are very mask-like. Um, but the waki is always someone living in the present, often a Buddhist priest or a Shinto priest or some other kind of traveler, and there might be accompanying ones as well. Thank you, and we'll go down a little bit. There's also um, the comic role or Kyogen, actually I might say the one right before that, that's the interlude role called the I Kyogen. In, that refers to a Kyogen actor who appears in uh, within a no play. Um, because in fact, there are two kinds of plays, no and Kyogen, and that's the title of this. The no is, is the kind of play that I'm generally describing. Kyogen plays are more sort of comic plays. Some of them are a little bit more black humor, that some of them don't have a lot of humor to it. I've taken people and said, this is the Kyogen, and they're all, oh good, this will be very humorous. But during the course of the play, no one seems to laugh. One wonders, that's a Kyogen, is what some people say. So it's kind of interesting there. But in any case, these get performed in a day set of plays. Um, uh, um, you'll have a no, a kyogen, a no. Uh, sometimes nowadays in the evenings, you just have two plays, and that's a kyogen and a no is quite uh, typical. But uh, when you have several plays in a day, you might no, kyogen, no, kyogen, no. <laughs> Three no, uh, two kyogen, for example. Um, um, and then going down just a little bit, you can see their appearance of kokata. Um, uh, that is child actors who come on, and they generally are children of actors, and this is their first time to be on a no stage. And slowly, uh, they sometimes get on the stage as young as three or four, uh, although Zayami wrote that a child should go on stage at the end of, uh, at his age of six, with six months and six days. Um, but in fact, a lot of ch children today are before that. And also at the back of the stage, you have a, a koken, a stage assistant. And to the right, you saw the chorus. And with a leader, uh, the chorus is usually made up of eight members, and they sort of sit in the back. And then you have the instrumentalists, which you also saw at the back. And I'm going to explain them just a little bit more. Um, can you move that down a little bit more now? And so next, we have these musical elements. And you heard some of it, the chant known as utai is very, very important. There are three types of things. And I'd like to, uh, because this did say to, um, I would demonstrate a couple of things. So I want to uh, sing just a little bit of um, uh, this in this melodic style, because the difference between the melodic and the dynamic, um, well, and the code and the stylized speech as well are, are uh, quite different, but 
dynamic probably more than anything is is quite different um, because melodic follows um, pitches that one might expect in song, but all of chant tends to be very sort of intense, uh, very powerful. Um, and I'm going to just sing a short little section in melodic style. He <laughs> I hope you get a sense that there are differences in pitch in all of that. And you can kind of hear them, and and perhaps you could even mimic those pitches. At the same time, it is very intense. So um, the vocal style in itself sometimes it, it takes a while um, to get to the point where you can do this. Now, dynamic chant is actually quite different. And uh, just to give you a, a little idea of that. Imamani <laughs> Me walks in the memana kokurami. I'll just go that far. Um, so the quality of that is is a little more difficult because it doesn't really, there is a pitch sliding about. It doesn't really settle on a pitch. Um, and some people might argue that the melodic doesn't settle on a pitch quite as much either not like a lot of songs in the rest of the world, but um, this sort of very chant or very sort of strong power behind it all. Um, but next I want to just give a short demonstration of what is called kotaba. And so it's really these three that gets get used. This is a stylized speech. And so when you do have characters speaking to each other, um, characters will sing melodic and dynamic. The chorus will sing melodic and dynamic, but the, the roles, the character roles will only sing the speech, the stylized speech. Um, the, the, uh, the chorus does not sing stylized speech. It's sort of this going up and down. And this particular place where I sang that, I sang it um, quite strong, and that's the way it is here. But in fact, a character, maybe an older character or a woman character, would also sing text. I'm going to sing the exact same text. Um, which fits uh, in a warrior play, a second category play. But if it was an older person singing or a woman singing, maybe in a third, a third category play, it would be a little bit more like this. That was the exact same text, but sung in a quite different way. And so 
there's a wide variety. And even the wagin and the gogin, wagin can be sung very powerfully or very softly. Gogin actually can also be sung very powerfully or very softly. So just to point that out. Now, um, uh, I would have liked to show you these uh, instruments, but um, you saw them a little bit at the back of the stage. There was a no flute, a kotsuzumi hand drum, an otsuzumi a side drum, and then a stick drum on the floor. One thing I will demonstrate, and it's quite unique about the drums, is the existence of kakegoe. And I guess I didn't write it here, but kakegoe are voice calls that the, the drummers uh, do. I guess it might have come up a little bit earlier, I forget. Um, I guess it did, yes. Um, but just to give you an idea, and I'll just say that I first heard the music of No uh, from a record that uh, two of my professors, that when I was an undergraduate, the year before I came to Japan, I was in a, a seminar on No, and they the first day they played this record and I heard these drum calls and quite frankly, I started, I, I, I was sitting with my a good friend of mine who got me into it, who said, you're going to Japan next year. You of all people should be in this seminar. And I was thinking at first I was going to be too busy, but I ended up being in the seminar and I heard these drum calls and tried very hard for a long period of time to contain my laughter from hearing it because it's such a strange kind of uh, vocalization. Yo, ho, yo, ho, yo, ho, ho, yo. It's actually a little strange to do it without having the drum here uh, because it's so much a part of playing the instrument itself. Um, but uh, it's just about that time where I want to kind of finish up and very quickly here, um, uh, if you can move down just a little bit more, I have references to uh, the various um, uh, dance terminology Mai is the one that is used for no. Those of you who know Japanese probably know the word odori, but in fact, odori is not used for no. Uh, that's the more typical word for dance in uh, Japanese. Mai is the word. And, and there are various things that are very important. Kamai, how one initiates or the posture that one stands. And you might have seen how the feet move on the floor it's a sliding feat called suriyashi or hakobi. Um, it's how one moves on the floor. But I'm, I have several classical masks here that I want to show uh, very quickly. Here is one, um, if you can see that. This is a komote or a young woman mask. And uh, it's a little difficult. I'm not sure how well you can, can see I it. I just hold it higher. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, that's about all I can get in. Maybe if I scoot back. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. And so uh, this is generally the young woman, maybe 18 to uh, 20 years of age. Um, some people might even say younger than that. There's a slightly older mask called a shikami. Uh, uh, I'm not sorry. sorry. Um, I have it written down there. What was I? What did I have? I all of a sudden it out of sight, out of mind. I'll get it. Um, shakumi. <laughs> I was saying I was putting the accent on the wrong syllable, I guess. Um, shakumi is also more of a middle aged woman mask. It uh, tends to be, um, I mean, there the differences might seem very slight, uh, but it but it is just very different. Uh, well, not very different. I mean, it's considered middle aged woman mask and use for such roles. Um, I then have a couple of, of male masks. The next one down is Kantan Otoko, 
Uh, this is used for, this is a young man, uh, but also used as a very strong and powerful god. Um, uh, Kang Tan is a famous Chinese play uh, that uses this mask. And so it's called Kang Tan Otoko because it was originally made for that mask or for that play, I guess. Uh, but it's used in a very, in another uh, play, a first category God play called Takasago and uh, used in that as well. Then I have yet another one, and this is uh, called Yase Otoko. And you might be able to see that uh, the uh, it's a, I'm sure it's a little difficult to see these masks uh, here, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of what these masks are like. Yase Otoko means emaciated man, generally a story about an older man who falls in love with a high ranking uh, woman, young woman who kind of in the end leads him off on and he uh, dies trying to prove his love for her and then comes back. Um, this is another mask quite well known. I'll move it back. I'm not sure how well you can it's see fine. it. Um, this is called Hanya. This is also quite well known. Some of you who might know a lot more about Japanese anime or manga uh, probably see references particularly to Komote or to Hanya. And uh, uh, I like often ask um, uh, audiences in, uh, in the States or in Europe, uh, is this male or female? And a lot of times people would say, well, of course it's male. And then they start thinking, now, why did he ask that question? Because it actually is female. Uh, women apparently when they become jealous, uh, grow horns at least in Japan they do. So, um, but there are demons, uh, not just demonesses uh, this way, but the male demons don't seem to grow those kind of horns that way. Um, so uh, is it all right if I go maybe just a little bit longer? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and uh, I was going to uh, maybe show some pictures of costumes but you saw some there, and I'll just make a comment. The costumes in No um, that you saw on the clip are, first of all, they're quite rich, they're expensive, they're quite elaborate. Um, so particularly something called kara odi, which is or Chinese weave. Um, uh, the origins of it come from China, but of course it really developed in Japan. Um, and uh, it's it, they're quite um, uh, elaborate costumes, some of the most elaborate costumes. And, I, and for that matter, the masks are probably some of the most elaborate masks uh, in the world. Um, I have various other things, conceptual aesthetic terms. I think I'm going to have to skip that. Um, you can probably look online if you want to know about the structure of uh, a no stage. So if you could move, um, scroll down, Tarek, to uh, the no in English. Um, uh, Bridge mentioned briefly that I've been involved in doing various uh, English no pl plays in English. Um, you see here that William Butler Yeats had written a play called At Hawk's Well. Um, and actually then this Arthur Little and Leonard Holvick uh, wrote a play called St. Francis which was about Francis of Assisi going to India and, uh, and uh, living uh, uh, in India and living among the poor in India. And this is, um, uh, I call these no influence plays. The Arthur Little and Leonard Holvick, they were my professors at Earlham College in uh, Indiana. Uh, and there, uh, they they had both spent time in Japan and created this place. And I say no influence plays because the structure, uh, in some ways, of the Little Hovik play was very no-like. But the music, 
was um, was influenced by no, but wasn't strictly no. And so that's why it's kind of special in that sense. But then what I call English no are the plays that followed. Uh, and these are ones, uh, I might have left out a couple here. Largely, these are ones that I wrote the music for. Uh, the one by David Crandall, he wrote both the text and the music for in Crazy Jane in 2007. But, and then the Sumida River was a translation that I made to put together with um, the, the original uh, music for that um, of it. So I had to adjust the text to that. But the other plays, um, including a version of At the Hawk's Well that Yeats did. So in many ways, um, I feel because Yeats wrote a play, you might call it, he called it a no play, but the music wasn't no at all. And from my own perspective, it almost seems like if if the music isn't no like, you know, um, you're really asking the performers to do something different from what they're trained to do. And, and to a certain degree, that's true if you have ballet. And so there really are a lot more plays. Um, I think uh, Bridge mentioned Benjamin Britten, uh, the Curlew River Opera. Um, so you would hardly call it uh, a no play in itself because performed by opera performers. And uh, no actors performed uh, opera. I don't think you would necessarily uh, call it an opera in itself. So these are some of the plays. Um, uh, I think you have a clip from YouTube from uh, Jeanette Chong's play, Pagoda. Um, and if you could show that clip um, next, Tariq, uh, I'd really appreciate it. I won't uh, um, go on too much further there, but if you can show that clip Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I think I'll have to end by, I just wanted to quickly show two masks. We have a mask maker he here in, in Tokyo who has made a number of masks for us, named Kitazawa Hideta. And uh, uh, you might have noticed on one of, uh, about a number of plays there, one was called Blue Moon Over Memphis. And so he made a couple of masks. Now, many of the stories in the English know have nothing to do with Japan. A couple of them do. Um, but uh, uh, one, uh, in any case, this one is Blue Moon Over Memphis, which is really about uh, Elvis Presley. And in the first half of the play, he appears as a uh, black man we call this the Robert Johnson mask because it's based on a blues singer. There were just photos of him in the 30s. And uh, uh, not that he specifically was influential uh, to um, Elvis, but he really um, uh, was, was quite known as a blues singer, but died very, very young uh, in the 1930s. And then, so we used his face for an example, for the role in the first half, and then in the second half came back as, the, and this is the Elvis mask that was made. Um, that might be a little bit more recognizable or suggestive of, uh, of the Elvis at a, at a particular age, but that becomes, that became the mask. And so some of our masks are in fact, uh, quite different in that way. Um, uh, the mask that you just saw now on Pagoda, it was uh, really a Chinese story. So in fact, those masks uh, are much more like some of the Japanese classical masks um, than, um, than, than the other stories that we have. But I think uh, we better stop at this point and, uh, uh, I will uh, hand things back to you. Uh, there are some other uh, things noted on the paper that I hope some of you will download and get a chance to uh, look at um, uh, later on. But I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick. Thank yeah. you very much. Tariq, will you take over?
Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, can I uh, request uh, Professor Anuradha Kapoor to uh, comment uh, and uh, as the discussant of this talk, please? Thank you, all friends here. And thank you, Rick, for an extraordinary uh, experience. Um, it's very hard to make a comment uh, when you see material uh, like this, which you know, overwhelms you in many ways. Um, but I just want to uh, say three things. And I think the importance of the, a work like this will probably maybe get categorized in three words that I'd like to just put forward and one would be translation, one would be adaptation, and one would be pedagogy. And I get it. I mean, I'm reminded, I think, of, of, a, of a, uh, two lines by Elizabeth Lecomte, who says, passing on a tradition by reinventing a play. And it seems to me that the, the whole uh, process of work that uh, Rick has presented is about passing on a tradition and reinventing a play where it brings us to many experiential as well as conceptual sort of shiftings. The other thing that I just wanted to say was that I think it's very important, something that was pointed out in the lecture, and that was that many of the no plays in English are not in Japan. They're not set in Japan. So I think that becomes an interesting point looking at this whole line about adaptation, but also about the uh, um, uh, the creative aspects of translation, and that translation is about taking things across borders. And it again, I'm, it reminds me of another uh, site. Uh, I cite sort of uh, it's not accurate, but something like uh, uh, Homi Baba says about translation that translation is a slow release tablet that affects different parts of the body differently. And I think looking at your work makes me think about that because it is slow release. It is about uh, reaching parts of one's uh, experience and one's givens and shake them up, not in any, not, not making us rethink everything from any, uh, you know, radical position, but actually rethink the everyday in very, many ways that gives us uh, perspectives. Uh, and I think that's very, very important. And the last part that I want to, I mean, the last word that I want to uh, and draw your attention to is the word pedagogy, which seems to be so connected to uh, Rick's practice over the years, which is actually, you know, I mean, in one sense, we could say it, that it's bringing no to people who don't know no, but it's also bringing an entire experience, which is what, I mean, I think pedagogy is about, you know, trying to bring in um, ways of seeing and ways of being which are not usual and uh, shedding uh, known things and unlearning, you know. I want to just make a connection uh, and I'll wind up after that, that whenever a module like uh, Pudyatam was brought into NSD. I'm afraid I missed that whole time you were there, uh, Rick, in NSD. I was not there. I was on a long leave. So it was something that I, I wish I had been there. But I, I just wanted to say that I'm drawing from an experience of putting in a module of Pudyatam in the NSD. And it, it used to make the students translate their experience in different languages. So what happens inside in a Kuryatam performance? Is it a soliloquy? Is it a monologue? Is it a, uh, is it a, is it something else? What is it? And the students found different ways. So sometimes they would call it an inner monologue and sometimes they would call it a soliloquy, thereby recognizing different ways of articulation. And I think that um, you're bringing out uh, uh, no, uh, performance languages and you call them dynamic and it's very important to see the fact that they are dynamic that's not something that stayed uh, for 650 years there but it has been reinvented and made more dynamic and by translating it by adapting it 
and by traveling it, I think it becomes uh, 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 allows or permits another kind of experience. And I think it's very important that this, uh, anybody learning uh, forms like what are seen as traditional or classical suddenly are able to make a bridge which unpacks that. And I think that's one of the most important things. And some, to hear you today, it also makes uh, possible that kind of illumination, that it's possible to un uh, unpack it and reach it and then uh, let it enter. I just want one thing that I'd like, uh, uh, Eric, for you to please uh, bring into your conversation at the moment is the conceptual aspect of Joha Q, which is very much, a, a, you know, people use it in acting all the time. But yes. I'm very grateful if you can uh, just elaborate on Joha Q for all of us. Well, um, I actually had two things mentioned there. Yugen is one of them and Joha Q is another. Um, they're very different concepts. Yugen is this sort of deep, dark mystery of, of performance. Um, but in fact, it comes from poetry and whatnot. Um, and so in many ways, it's not something that the actor can, can just turn on or turn off. Um, it's the result of how the play uh, is done. And particularly, it's more with these third category plays. First category plays, and even some of this, I would say the second category plays aren't that so much. It's the very slow, very poetic kind of third category play. And so uh, Yugen has been something that is often mentioned, but never in, in my studies as a teacher said to me, okay, do it again with more Yugen. You, you, you really can't do that. On the other hand, Joha Q is a sense of Jo is sort of starting off slow. Ha is a development. Q is a coming to a little bit more faster ending. And that's the one terminology. But it also has a little bit of a sense of going from kind of a development on a line from simplicity to complexity. And so you have a complexity in the, in, uh, the movement, or you start with some of the very simple movements the simple uh, move, um, patterns of the drums, uh, the, and and uh, and the more the kind of simple uh, poetry, and then sort of moving into something a little more complex. But it also has to do with individual movements, and so people would say, "How you enter the stage, you start with a, a sense of being a little s slower, and then." increase a little bit. That doesn't mean you start slow and then go faster and faster and faster. It's really not that so much. You start slow and you maintain that, but it moves along just a little bit faster. And it then, you know, in the end, it doesn't seem like it's going that much faster, but it's clear that it has gone faster. And so even a movement of the hand where you're starting and you're just even that people will say that has Joha Q to it. So um, individual movements might have Joha Q. A section within a play has Joha Q within it. Um, a, a scene has Joha Q. The act, as in the first act or the second has, has a sense of Joha Q. And then the overall play has a sense of Joha Q. And it doesn't it's not entirely just speed. It's also a, an appropriate beginning, appropriate development, appropriate ending. And it, it's not just something, uh, you know, like it has to be going faster at the end or something. But what is that appropriate kind of arc that gets created uh, in it? And I would say that's the way it's, it is more or less used um, in a lot of different ways. Um, or the overall play, but individual acts, individual scenes, individual um, sections, individual movements, the music, everything gets a, a certain Joha cue to it. And so even in an individual line of text, uh, 
Even that is supposed to have this line of sung text to have a certain degree of johaku to it. So that gives a little bit of an idea, I hope. Sorry, sorry, this putting on the mic and putting off the mic is. No, I mean, I'm just saying thank you very much for bringing that and, ex, you know, expanding on that because it's something that I think many, many practitioners use without necessarily even uh, uh, working through the fact but that that it's there and that there are structural things from from a line to a scene to the act to the whole play yeah. and that they all have certain appropriate energies yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and it, it looks to me i think something that when you said that it, it's appropriate i think one of the most interesting things perhaps about theater like uh, uh, no or you know i mean theater itself is that so many different energies are at the same platform at the same time and can be distinguished and i think that's that's the you know yeah. uh, magic of it so looking at uh, 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 pagoda also you suddenly see the language becoming something else uh, the uh, hearing becoming something else because it's allowing you certain defamiliarization so um, uh, I, I just i just want to end by saying that it's been uh, it's been a journey to through your work and it's something that brings, uh, you know, as as a practitioner or as a as a person who thinks at uh, you know about theatre, very many illuminating uh, possibilities. So thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know uh, if uh, Prasab Tanka, you, you want to say a few words before, uh, before we open the house for questions. You are on mute. You, you are on You're mute. muted, Bridge. Uh, Bridge, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I don't have much to say. That's why I'm muted. But no, what I was going to say is we should open it to questions. And uh, uh, if uh, Janet would like to say something, I think she's here. Oh, yes. Janet um, is also here. Good. Yeah, I thought I saw her briefly, but. Um, Hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. Long time. She's my partner in crime in uh, in no the UK, crime. and uh, uh, we worked on uh, several different pieces together. And there's a very good uh, internet site that I have listed at the bottom of the page there. So if any of you print out that page, you can see the Between the Stones um, website, which has a lot of things that Jeanette has uh, made, and it's up there. So that's an introduction by me for you, Jeanette. <laughs> uh, your mic, Jeanette. Jeanette, your mic. Uh, sorry, yeah. I only learned about the lecture 25 minutes ago. So. Yeah, really. <laughs> apologies, apologies. I talked so to her it's, yesterday, it's, but I I didn't say anything about it actually. So. Well, it's it's a great privilege, uh, I have to say. Um, I I miss India. I used to work um, with India for five years. I worked um, uh, on uh, higher education projects uh, more generally, not specifically art and uh, performing arts. But um, it it took me to India many on many occasions, and uh, I haven't been for many many years. So. Um, it's a delight to even virtually visit India. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I don't know what I can add to uh, Rick's. Uh, I'm, I always learn masses every time I listen to Rick and I've had that pleasure for um, uh, just over a dozen years now. We've worked together on different projects. Um, we've worked on uh, two um, more traditionally um, structured uh, no plays. Um, Pagoda was the first one and then more recently Between the Stones. Um, and we also worked on a very conceptual um, piece which we which um, came under a program for as a tribute for Akiri uh, 
uh, Matsui, who um, was in London, and we wanted to do a tribute for his 70th birthday. Uh, those of you who are, who are really interested in Rick's history, we did try to pull this together. Um, I put together um, a tribute to Rick. Uh, it's a book that is actually on the website. If you go to betweenthestones.com and look at uh, Rick's page under About Us and you go to his name, it will lead you to um, a virtual uh, PDF of, uh, it's a low resolution PDF, forgive me, but that's you know you, what you can put up. Um, and um, it sort of tries to chart Rick's life with comments from people who've worked with him from around the world over his more than 40, 50, almost years of working with No. Um, so uh, it was an absolute uh, privilege to pull that together. Um, for somebody like Rick, who spent his entire life, literally <laughs> his working life, um, really trying to help all of us understand this um, amazing art form. I always regard, every time Rick and I are together, I'm always regarding myself as a novice, a sort of 12 year old novice <laughs> um, in terms of working with no. It is something that um, obviously the more you work with it, the more you understand it. Um, and then Rick chimes in and he says, well, I'm a kind of 40, 50 year old novice. And, um, <laughs> and when, when I'm writing a play, I say to Rick, what do you think? And he says, well, shall we wait um, uh, 200 years and maybe, you know, we'll, we'll see how well the play is received, you know? So it is one of those art forms that um, you delight in the present, you delight in the past, and you certainly look forward to the future. Um, it's always a great honor, I think. Um, to have the privilege of working with people like Rick and all the people I've worked with in Japan. Um, I, I have actually, through Rick, um, and not through Rick actually, originally, um, I've worked very closely with the Oshima No Family uh, Theatre, and um, they were my first, very first introduction to No. Um, and they introduced me to Rick. So that's how we kind of all, you know, eventually knitted together, I would say. And I've stayed friends with them um, throughout this entire period. And um, the two traditional pieces that I've worked on have always been with the Oshima North Theatre family. Um, and we were so delighted that in uh, the latest piece, Between the Stones, <laughs> two huge delights were A, that, uh, no, three, I'm going to say three. A, the first one is that Rick who some of you will not know had a stroke um, the year before we uh, did this piece um, and cancelled everything. And then miraculously <laughs> he recovered from this stroke. Um, and he said, no, no, let's go ahead. We must go ahead with the tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Oshima family said, well, if, if you're feeling well enough, Rick, um, let's do it because you know we have something for 2021 and we would like to do this in 2020. None of us knew that there would be a major pandemic um, and that uh, everything would stop around the world. <laughs> and we finished this tour because of Rick's uh, bravery and courage, I think, in, in just going ahead with it as planned. Um, we finished this tour literally just a few weeks before all of Europe and the rest of the world closed down. Um, we finished it in February 2020. So the Oshima family came over and it was just quite, really quite miraculous. If you do want to see the play Between the Stones, it's also on the website. You can see the entire play. Um, and uh, it is the last performance uh, that we performed in Paris at the National Green No Star. Theatre. Bridge was there, actually. <laughs> Um, and it was performed at the um, Musée Guimet, which is the National Museum for uh, Asian Arts in Paris. And um, uh, that's uh, the second uh, amazing thing about it was that it was the first um, performance internationally. In fact, it was the very first visit that uh, Iori Yoshima, who is the sixth generation of uh, the Oshima family um, performed abroad. He's in fact an ex a very experienced Kokata. 
but at the time he was 11 years old and it was his first visit outside of Japan <laughs> and his international debut as well at the South Bank Center in London and then toured obviously with everybody. So, I mean, that was just amazing to have an, a skilled Kokata um, of such a high caliber. He's, I think Rick would say, known as a rising star um, in the no world. And um, he was just absolutely wonderful um, to have with us. And of course, we had um, the wonderful Kinue Oshima playing the uh, shite role. And um, being the only professional female performer um, uh, in the Kita school, it's always a privilege to have um, uh, Kinue with us. And I have to say, Rick, again, this is part of his silent history, almost, that, um, you know, he's the one who promotes the people who don't get promoted a great deal internationally. And we've tried to do that, I think, through our work. We've, we've also, together with Rick and I, have just uh, worked on a book about um, uh, Kitazawa-san, The Mask Maker, um, we put together a book of all of his work, which again is just such a huge privilege. So I'm, I'm, I, I do feel myself that I'm one of the privileged people that by accident, I always say my story with no is complete and utter serendipity. I never planned it in my life. It came to me, I went to it. However, serendipity works. Um, I was a fortunate person to uh, come across No at uh, a time of my life, frankly, when I was just thinking of retiring uh, fully. And so my entire retirement now has been a renaissance, uh, thanks to No. Um, I have found um, a voice, voice, my own voice in writing. It's allowed me to add my own creativity to the mix of all of these wonderful performing artists that I have been so privileged to work with. Um, and I think a huge part of that is because of working very closely with, with Rick over these years. So I'll stop there, but thank you, Rick. And thank you, Bridge, for inviting me. Whoops, Tarek, now you're... <laughs> you're <here. laughs> I just joined the bandwagon, okay. Uh, I think we are a bit short on time, but uh, if it, it's okay to just stretch a little bit more. I don't mind uh, if anyone has any specific questions, I'm quite... Yes, please. So, uh, yeah, yes, uh, so anyone in the audience, if you have any questions, have question. uh, please uh, go ahead and ask. Uh, your question. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Or you can uh, write uh, in the chat box and then I will read it out. Yes, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, Rick for his fascinating and very informative presentation. And each time, as uh, Janet and uh, uh, Anuradha were saying before me, I, each time we listen to him talking about no theater, we learn so much. So thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, I was very interested in uh, what Janet was just saying now about um, the, the question of how you can transpose the aesthetics of traditional Japanese no uh, using the English language. Uh, as Rick, you, you showed us very clearly, uh, I think in the aesthetics of no, of course, there are two complementary aspects, the language which is used on the one hand, and also all the visual aspects of the performance. What I have been very interested in uh, seeing when I was, I was actually very lucky to see the, to, to attend the performance of Between oh. the Stones uh, in Paris, uh, when it was shown in the Musée Guimet. And it helped me to realize uh, that um, um, if you want, if you try to transpose no theater into English, of course, you can retain all the visual elements of traditional no, but because you are changing, you're switching to another language, then the real challenge is to find ways to also transpose the aesthetics principle 
into English. So my question would be, my question would be uh, to both uh, Rick and Janet, uh, since she she uh, realized this exceptional uh, thing of uh, transposing no into into English. What what are the main challenges for an English speaker who tries to retain some of the effects of the which are used in the Japanese language? Could you could you just like give us one or two examples of how you manage to uh, 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 switch from Japanese to English and retain some of the aesthetics, uh, aesthetic characteristics of the Japanese a language, which is used in no theater? Well, uh, I'll speak first on that. And Jeanette, if you have something to add, please do. Um, I, I would just say that, first of all, you, you have to have a text. And the text, if it can be kind of no like in the sense it's, it needs to be highly poetic. And um, I think it needs to be a densely poetic in some ways too. That is to say, um, uh, you know, I mean, they're lyrics in a sense, but, but it needs to have a certain kind of feel to it. Now, I would never say that the English has to be treated in the same way the Japanese is treated because the characteristics of English and the characteristics of Japanese are completely different. And so you have to come up with a text and also being aware, I mean, later on, I've worked with Jeanette and, and she's making the text, but I've worked with her very closely and we go over the text. And I, we probably had, she probably sent me 20, 25 different iterations of the text as we did it. And it was only after that, that I really started composing music for it. And even in the compositional practice, then I went back to her and said, is there some way we can make a, some adjustments here and there? And those were kinds of things. And of course, that's why it's good to work with someone that you can do those kind of things because the music becomes the vehicle to, to obviously to perform it. And then, then of course you have the movement itself, but, but obviously how the music and the text work together becomes very important, but it never can be exactly in the same way that you have with Japanese and English. But I understand what's happening with the Japanese and English. And so I'm able to kind of make it. And one of the things that I'm always aware of is doing it in such a way that our musicians who tend to be Japanese will be able to do even if they don't know English that well. And so there are there are tricks to all of that because they have patterns that work and and the way they come together. And if you don't follow those and you just write something and you put it down in a Western musical style and just do this, you know, they do this without memoriz I mean, by memorization, without the music in front of them. And so that becomes very important. I would like to add, and I forgot to say it when I talked about Sumida River, where I went through the process of taking the play Sumida Gawa and translating it into a performance translation that would fit with the music. And when I, I had the Otsuzumi player um, who came to my house the very first time and I sang it for him and he followed the, the way I write out the score when I'm writing in English. When I wrote it out, he followed it and went through everything. And then he said, oh, it's just the same as the Japanese. And of course, that's the highest compliment. It isn't the same as the Japanese, but he could understand it in the same way. And that was very important. And I'll only add to that, that I've gone to Mexico City for three years now, and we're trying to do a Spanish version of Sumida River. And so this will be the second time after the Hindi version that I made before, where I'm helping create a piece in a language that I don't understand. So uh, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if you have something to add, Jeanette, to any of that. 
I, I think I would only say, and I think probably all theatre people know this far better than I do, uh, but um, this is a collaborative art form. You can't do performing arts without collaborating with people. If you're writing poetry and you're just writing poetry, it's just you're writing poetry. But if you're writing poetic forms that have to be performed by people, then you have to collaborate with people. And most critically, of course, you have to collaborate. This is a performing arts that has music and you must collaborate very, very closely with the person who is going to be interpreting your words into a language that all of the other performing art artists who are going to be singing it and playing it actually understand. So that deep sort of collaboration and understanding between people when you collaborate is absolutely key. Um, and I think that, you know, every step of the way that you're learning something, I have a story I want to tell, it <laughs> seems. Yeah, when, that's the way I start. I have a story I want to tell. Uh, but how I tell it, if I choose this art form, then I'm in the hands of all the artists that I'm working with and how well I can collaborate with those, those artists, understanding their needs as well as my needs in telling a story is really the key to how we finally can put a performance together. I mean, people, I guess, like all theatre, um, people who go and watch a performance on stage, they have no idea generally how much work goes into getting a performance on stage, how much collaboration goes on over quite an extensive period of time um, to do that. And um, I think I've always, I've been lucky that I've approached it as always, a, a, you used the word pedagogy earlier, um, and, you know, I'm a learner. If I approach things as a learner, it means that I can keep my mind open to everything that I can learn on the way. And whether that's a suggestion coming from an 11 year old boy <laughs> or, you know, uh, a 70 plus year old man um, with all of the experience they bring to this art form, we have, you have so much to learn that it becomes a joy. And I think that's really why it's always remained to me a privilege, because it's a joy to work with these amazing people who have such wonderful skills that they're pooling together um, to create one thing, a performance. And that is just quite incredible, really. If only people knew, and that's why when Rick, he is um, the fact that he goes around the world telling people, you know, about this art form. That's the only way people can really understand just what is involved and how much, you know, um, he's bringing together in his lifetime's work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there uh, any more questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, wondered uh, what was the experience of the uh, Japanese uh, participants? I know Matsui has had a lot of experience uh, performing everywhere. In, um, but what about the others? Uh, well, I'll, I'll only say that I know, I think probably Jeanette and I both remember um, actually when she first said, I want to do this, but I absolutely want to do it with the Oshimas. I knew the Oshimas from long before uh, and worked with them, but but there were very few people uh, that I would say, you know, um, I don't know if they'll want to perform this or not, you know, and uh, but but she convinced me that maybe we could approach them. And I think they also approached the whole idea at the beginning with a certain amount of trepidation. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think might have said to Jeanette, oh, well, you should talk to Rick about this because he does that kind of thing. Not because we want to be a part of that. It's just because he's the one who does that. But then when Jeanette sort of insists that, but you actually have to get them involved too, then all of a sudden, that was kind of interesting in that process. 
but but it's true because there have been a number of people and some people who agreed to work with me from the beginning uh, who knew the kind of things I was doing and and were able to understand how I was doing it. And it started with the instrumentalists, really being able to present something in English that they can play to. And then if I can get chorus members and they whether they're singing, singing in English, maybe they need to be uh, people who understand English. And, uh, you know, it, and so some of them originally were, were foreigners in Japan. But, um, and that's how this idea of theater nogaku group actually began. And so, um, I mean, it's, it's going through this process. And so what was interesting, what started generally working with some Japanese um, who were generally musicians who understood what I was doing and I could communicate to them exactly how they could do this, even though they didn't understand the English necessarily. Um, they could then still do it. But then going the next step, and the one thing about Between the Stones this last time is that we had two professional um, no actors who said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll sing. One, there was one more there who could have sung, but he kind of said, no, I don't think so. You need more people backstage to help with things. But we had two that were in the chorus. And I thought, okay, generally when they sing in Japanese, they're in the back row because they're more experienced. But they said, no, 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 you have to be in the back row. We'll be in the front row because you're more experienced singing no in English. And so, um, you know, that was sort of interesting uh, process that we've gone through in that regard. I'll just add a very quick sentence, literally, because it's the answer to your question, Bridge. Um, I would have to say that everybody approaches uh, what we've done as learners. It's not just me. I mean, I think we're all learning something. And our Japanese colleagues in particular, remember, they have much, much more at stake. This is their profession. You know, this is their forward facing, you know, image to the world. Um, they have far more at stake by being learners in this in, in in performing English and yet they have put everything at stake to work with us and that is is so impressive that our Japanese colleagues have been so courageous in taking this step with us foreigners I think are much more used to collaborating internationally you know we don't really hesitate we just think it's wonderful to do it but for our Japanese colleagues they do it far less and for them to be so courageous and so um, you know embrace all embracing and want to share their learning with us that's really quite amazing really when you think of it it is there is a couple of questions there I think Yes, uh, I think uh, we have a question from Sohela Kapoor next. Yes. Please. Yes. Uh, you are muted. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. We're talking about people performing in a language that they don't understand. The Japanese instrumentalists who perform, played a new setting or, uh, you know, poetry in English. I had a similar experience here. Uh, we had a song which with English, particular kind of a voice. So we got a, a Oops. You lost you. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, now he sang, yeah, he sang that song in English without understanding what he was saying, he was only told the general theme because he only spoke Arabic and French. So, you know, this is a, it's, it's a close experience I've just had. And he stuck the rhythm and he blended beautifully when we heard the result. The amazing part was that he didn't really understand what he was singing, except that he knew he was singing a romantic song. That's it. 
but he pronounced it. I was correcting his pronunciation and he sang that song. We recorded it. So, you know, that's just further conversation. But uh, the basic difference between no and no, no is serious, Yogan is more comedy. But uh, if you can just give me a small elaboration and do they have a similar training background? The process is the same. Um, I'll answer that. Um, the one thing about um, Kyogen is, uh, you know, one is serious, one is comedy. The themes perhaps are serious, but uh, even in comedy, as actors, both of them are very, very serious about what they do. And uh, they make a point of, of saying that. Uh, in general, a lot of aspects of training, they use the same stage, of course, how they move on the stage, uh, whether it's their body posture or how they uh, use suryashi, that movement is similar. And uh, and uh, the Kyokan actors, as I say, perform in no plays. And a number of no musicians, not so often, but on occasion, will perform in Kyokan plays. So there's a deep relationship. And they always share backstage. So they all know each other. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty well accepted. When you talk about the word no gaku in itself, um, that refers to both no and kyogen. And so the no gaku performers association includes both of them. And uh, in, in principle, kyogen, you can have a night of kyogen plays only. But in general, if you have two no plays, you really have to have a Kyogen play in between as well, too. So there's so, sort of a, a sense that you always have to hire Kyogen actors as well, too. And, uh, and in fact, in general, the Kyogen actors tend to be, uh, because they also perform in other things, uh, there are a couple of really well-known Kyogen actors who are, are quite well-known in the world, in the performance world outside of No, uh, much more than than probably any No actor. So uh, perhaps that answers it a little bit. Yes, thank you. Is there any other questions that? None. <laughs> Sorry, that's my husband in the background. <laughs> if no one has a question, can I ask one more? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to, I think, what you began with, uh, you know, there have been a number of people who uh, in the West uh, who've uh, used no techniques or, or tried to replicate no. In Japan, there have been only a couple of cases, most famously Mishima Yukio. Uh, then there were a couple of others who uh, tried to write modern no plays. Why do you think uh, you know, no has not uh, played any role in, say, modern Japanese theater, or does has it? Well, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding about um, Mishima, uh, because what he wrote were plays modern plays based on no stories, but they're not plays to be performed by no actors. They're mm -hmm. plays to be performed by um, West, basically Western trained actors. And so it's largely misunderstood. Oh, Mishima wrote no plays. Uh, he didn't write no plays in himself. He wrote no um, plays that were based on no stories is what it was. And there are others who have done that. There are, there are certain people who have uh, included um, no elements in, again, in contemporary um, plays that are, that are not to be performed necessarily by no actors, but more by, by um, sort of contemporary or even Western trained uh, performance. And so in a sense, what you really have, you don't have a lot of people who are in sort of Western trained uh, performance who have studied no, really. That's very rare, you know. Um, 
there is some contemporary theater that uses some of the energy. Um, Suzuki Tadashi is certainly one who is often mentioned as having this sort of very strong energetic style, um, but and and a vocal style as well. But it's really not specifically no. And uh, sometimes some no actors have worked with those people, but it doesn't, for example, contain a lot of the musical aspects of no. But one thing I would add is that when I started doing a lot of music for this back in the early 80s, and then throughout the 80s, there were three or four plays that I worked on to do um, um, kind of performance and started doing um, English text with the music of no. Um, and so, and something I would call uh, English no. And other people would always, there were people, and these were not just Japanese, there were enough foreigners who would say, well, that's not no. And I said, I, I, I know that, it's English no. <laughs> you know, that I would make that as a caveat. It's, it's, it has to be different as we've already talked about. But, um, you know, at that time, I remember having one, uh, one of my, my main Otsuzumi teacher and asking him a question. It wasn't specifically about what I was doing and I didn't even really know because he wasn't one person I was asking to be a part of all of this. He made the comment to me, he said, I, because there were a few new no plays that were just starting up. And it was generally, these were generally being done by higher ranking actors. Lower ranking actors would never think of doing that. It, you'd have to be the head of the school or someone really quite uh, higher up in order to do that. And even then, if they were younger, there was a lot of criticism about any of those kind of changes. And so this particular um, drummer, uh, and he's still alive, he's a living national treasure now, he had said to me at that point, he said, oh, there are 240 plays in the No repertory. And just learning all of those and having to perform those all the time, that's a lifetime of work by itself. Why do you have to have new No plays? Is what his first idea, of course, from about, also in the mid 80s, when the National No Theater got created, they didn't do it at first, but by the end of the decade, they started suggesting, well, let's, let's create a couple of new No plays. They would bring some scholars in and some No actors in. And what happened in the 90s is that slowly there were a lot more No performers and, and uh, No actors not just the only the heads of schools and whatnot, but others who were also starting to create no plays. Now, there aren't a lot of them, but instead of having um, maybe two or three every five years, you now probably have five or six every year. Now that's not a lot. It's still 98% of the plays performed are, are classical plays, but, People do that and they do do that. And there's also a revival. There are revival, revivals of plays that, in a sense, and that's what kind of started with the National No Theater, a revival of a play that you have a text from 500 years ago, but all the music, all the movement has been lost. Well, let's do that. And for people who said, no, you can only do the traditional play, it was sort of hard to say, no, yo, you can't do that. But in fact, when the people got together to collaborate, to do this, there were all these people that things they had to create. They had to create the music, they had to create the, the movement. And so it was 80% creation. And sometimes even the text, there were parts of it that were missing and it had to be sort of changed and added to and whatnot. And so, here were plays that that just parts of the text or the text itself was left over from 400 years ago. And all of a sudden, well, let's do this again. And so um, that also helped create this idea. And so now I would say there are more new no plays being created. Shinsaku no is what it is, newly created plays. And so um, these are, are, are being performed today. Thanks. 
Janet? If I could just add one one thing, I think, uh, Bridge, for me, I see it as part of a spectrum, a kind of intercultural spectrum. You know, all the people that write plays, they write them in their lifetime. And what, whether we're looking at somebody who wrote, you know, several hundred years ago, or whether we're looking at somebody who's writing now, I think we it's important to understand that pe when people write, they're writing in their lifetime. And, and, and that means that it's a continuous process. It may be a very slow, continuous process, and it's got certainly got all of the chinks in it that Rick has described eloquently, but it is a continuous process. And, and I think to sort of think of, oh, those are classical plays, these are Nuno plays, you know, in two quite distinct sort of ends of, two spe of a spectrum is missing out on everything that has developed in the lifetime of those people. And uh, dare I say it, um, I hope I'm not speaking out of, out of line here, but I'm pretty sure that when uh, Ken Army, Zay Army and all of the other mm -hmm. early writers they were influenced by what was going on in their lifetime. Oh, right. um, and I always remember when we were performing Pagoda in China and um, uh, we were, I was asked to join a television <laughs> interview and I said, oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. And one of the questions that came up uh, immediately, they said, this is a Chinese story. You're, why are you performing it in a Japanese art form? <laughs> and I said, because they asked me. You know, and, and I wrote a story and somebody wants to perform it in the way they want to perform it. You know, stories can be told by anybody anywhere in the world. And I believe personally, as an internationalist, <laughs> personally, the more international you are, the more open you are to the blending of cultures. And uh, sometimes you want to be as pure in a cultural form as you would like, which is what I, we were trying to do with Pagoda and with Between the Stones. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes you want to blend your cultures much more. I think we're living in an age where people have traveled so much around the world and, and know so much more about each other's cultures that this intercultural uh, dimension of probably all performances um, you know, is beginning to be understood a little better. And if you were to dig, and if you were to sort of like an onion, peel off the layers of those writers, you know, what was influencing them in their lifetime, I'm pretty sure you will find intercultural sort of references buried in there. It's just that, you know, as time passes, you begin to see them much more in a kind of purist way. That's probably a little um, unreal. <laughs> in many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 we are and yes, please. Yes, please. Your microphone. Just just, just a last uh, uh, comment from my side. I, I really think what uh, how we're talking now is extremely important because in some senses, this is where, you, uh, you know, the word uh, international and internationalist and uh, intercultural get all braided and it's really important to figure out the fact that in fact there is no pure form and we argue that all the time in India and I think that that's something that we need to argue all the time because when we uh, when we do that when we actually make forms pure it's impossible to teach them and I mean, we often often get that in the uh, you know I used to get it in National School of Drama or we get it with students saying, I want to do Shakespeare as Shakespeare would have done it. Who knows? <laughs> exactly. You know? So I mean, so we would have to ask that. And when we say this is a Sanskrit play done as it was done three thousand years ago, we have no, absolutely not, not even any visual, um, you know, uh, direct visual uh, connections to be made. So. The reinvention of a tradition is, I think, its continuation rather than, you know, looking backwards. So, I, I, I personally, I'm you. absolutely fascinated by the fact that we don't really know the origins 
of the origins of the origins of no. I mean, you know, there's the there's Chinese, there's Indian links in there. There's all kinds of other things that probably we just do not know. It's just too far removed. And and the sad thing in these in this no story, the wonderful thing, of course, is that Zayami wrote so much in his lifetime that we can learn from it. The sad thing is that. You know, we don't know as much from his father, who clearly really influenced him a great deal. And one would love to know, you know, what was he thinking when he was developing his pieces and, you know, what was influencing him at that time? That would be so wonderful to know. So I think we can only imagine it. But the nice thing is looking to the future is that we can actually use our own experience now by creating new stories and building, you know, bringing cultures together and learning from other cultures. That's so fascinating. We have, I think, as, as humanity, as a, a global uh, you know, story to tell from our lifetime. And gosh, are there so many fascinating stories we should be telling right now about our lifetime. I think that's, that's what you know, future generations should be looking forward to. Well, I think, um... We've gone way beyond, but it's been <laughs> a very interesting discussion. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. And let me thank everyone for uh, coming here. And, uh, you know, it's been, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, this is not my normal area of work, but it's been very enjoyable. Tariq? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting much. me. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, joining everyone. And thank you uh, to the speaker, Professor Richard Emmert, and uh, the discussant, Professor Anuradha Kapoor, to the chair, Professor Bish Danka, and also special thanks to the Japan Foundation New Delhi. Uh, the Director General uh, Sato San is here. Thank you very much for all your support. And I think we have had an incredibly stimulating discussion uh, after the uh, equally interesting talk and uh, this is the first uh, in a series of lectures and I have shared uh, the a, a list of the future lectures and there hopefully there will be some more after that and uh, I have also shared uh, the feedback form for today's event uh, for those uh, who participated in today's event please uh, mm -hmm. fill up the feedback form uh, it will help us uh, in organizing future events as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and see you soon in some other event. Thank, thank you. you. Many thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank